creating this sort of less intimidating environment is one where it then facilitates a much more open dialogue between esthetician and clients where there, there are these nuggets of information and, and aha moments where people really learn and understand their skin from an expert so they they leave heyday feeling a lot more empowered and equipped on you know how to use when to use and why to use their products to get the best out of their skin this is the safari The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast, which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Welcome back to The Safari. This is Morty Singer speaking, and we are March 12th in New York City. And I must say, things seem to be perking up around here. Um, the city is a little bit more vibrant, and I think vaccinations and all such good things are causing the world to spin a little faster than ever before. Today, we have an incredible uh, entrepreneur uh, speaking to us. Adam Ross is the CEO and founder of Heyday, which is, I think, the Tesla of facials. And you can hear all about what he does and how he does it uh, later on in this program. But it's really interesting to talk, talk about touch uh, in the post-pandemic world, about uh, what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means to be an entrepreneur that comes out of the financial world, which is something I always talk about on this podcast. So um, Adam is, a, is, is an incredible guy. He'll tell us all about himself and we should get started. Adam, how are you? So nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Where in the world are you on, on this March day, this fake spring that we're experiencing? I'm, I'm experiencing it with you in, uh, in the Lower East Side. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. Well, Adam, you, you come to, to this, this uh, podcast with a long uh, history in, in both finance and as an entrepreneur, and you've had your hands in, I think, a few other businesses as well. Give the listeners a little bit on you and your background. You're obviously an Aussie uh, and how you came over here. And, um, and let's take it there. Okay, great. Um, I, I will actually say, despite being over here, Morty, for I think now 20 20 years, uh, I did get my U.S. citizenship last year. So I'm this, there we this go. Like hybrid, hybrid U.S.-Australian uh, combination. But, uh, you know, for the listeners here, my background, um, I, I had a little over a dozen years in mergers and acquisitions, um, and I'd focus specifically in the consumer product and retail sectors. Um, I did a little under two years in, uh, in Australia, um, splitting my time between Sydney and Melbourne, um, and then and then transitioned to New York, where I worked with uh, UBS for a number of years, and then um, I ultimately was a, a founding member of a boutique advisory firm called Cineview Partners. Um, one of my sectors in banking, I think, as you increasingly specialise over time, was was actually within beauty. So, to my mind, that you know that covered a lot of work with Revlon, Avon, you know, PNG, Gillette, Lauder and L'Oreal. So, I I certainly got to see. I'd say like the product side of, of, of beauty and and seeing that from the banking perspective. Um, but, you know, to my mind, I think while, while banking is an incredible stepping stone, uh, you know, to my mind, I wanted to be on the other side of the table um, and I think be involved in building, uh, you know, world-class, you know, brands and businesses that, that, that delight the customer. So um, I left Cineview Partners end of 2010 um, and prior to Heyday, I was actually a, a co-founder of a footwear business called Saludos. Um, great, but, great brand. Uh, no, it, it was great. I mean, I think the playbook with that one was to was to brand a generic category, um, you know, similar to what Javianas did did very successfully with flip flops. And I think you were seeing this this real growth in casual footwear. Um, you know, certainly seeing it in in apparel and athleisure and things like that. So. 
I think there was something interesting about bringing branding and sensibility and design to a category that that you know it didn't really exist. Yep. Um, so that was that was an incredible um, you know few years and you know ran that business. We we self funded it before getting an outside investor, and I transitioned to uh, to the board, and I'm, I'm still a board member today. But you know had the I think the light bulb moment for for heyday um, as I was making that transition, Morty, where I think when you just look at the category, there was just so many companies in the sector that were focusing on pushing products rather than actually like helping consumers do what's right for their skin. So I think I was struggling a little bit in terms of how to look after my skin and found it pretty overwhelming and confusing. And I think speaking with a number of girlfriends, you know, everyone was equally frustrated. So I became convinced that there had to be a better way. And I think any any new business should start with, um, you know, sort of solving a problem or, or the, the, the the statement that a better solution should exist. So, so, so describe a little bit though the 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 issue that beheld the. I think you did the, the first one was in New York, right? Am I right about that? First location, New York, uh, yeah. twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so before that opening, uh, what did you feel was missing specifically in the services rendered? And describe them maybe, and then explain how they they differ now uh, in what you offer. Yeah, it's a great question. I think. I mean, skincare, I think one of the biggest ahas in the early days, Morty, was the fact that like skincare is the number two daily routine in people's lives behind food and beverage. And there's no trusted brand, you know, there's no source of truth. And I think we found that there, people certainly don't have products, uh, accessibility issues. Um, you look at the growth of of products uh, online and it, it just, it, it's a massive category. It continues to grow. Uh, no one's approaching it from the, more of a professionalized angle or just from an expertise perspective. So I think when we looked at skincare just more broadly, it was just, it's three broken legs on the stool. There was the services category that you touched on that is incredibly fragmented and I think really out of touch in terms of operating to an outdated playbook. And I'll come back to that in a second, but you then had this middle stool of big box retailer, whether that's like an ultra Sephora you know, just a lot of products like more is better approach in the store and it's it's quite an overwhelming sales experience. And then online, which is literally just taking that that big box physical experience and replicating that um, with the website where there's a lot of products, there's a lot of sort functionality, but there's no messaging, there's yep. no point of view and there's no real IP around it. And I think to our mind, we wanted to build a brand that could unite and combine those three disparate legs on the stool. So we said like, let's start with services um, because we're huge proponents of, of credentialing a brand with sort of a high touch physical experience, um, knowing that you need some of that differentiation to then build a world class online business yeah, and, and building trust in, in, in so doing, right? A- abs- absolutely. I mean, I think when you look at, um, you know, skincare, like the real experts in the category are estheticians, which is this 250,000 plus employment class that's reasonably under the radar, uh, so they're quite unknown and, and, and an unappreciated employment class in terms of their expertise and how they can democratise skincare. And I think when we looked at the category, you have these high-end spas. They're multi-service. Uh, they're generally targeting a female-centric clientele who's got both time and money to engage. Um, and then you've got other cheap options, Morty, but they're they're sort of cheap in a bad way and absolutely like nothing in between. And I think, I think a great analog actually for our business would be would be somebody like a Warby Parker, where they like took the structural dynamic of the category, and said there is no reason why like design a frame should be like north of two hundred dollars. Uh, there can be a trade off in price without a trade off in quality, and there's this big big gap in the middle for an aspirational brand that can target a younger um, a younger consumer that wants to engage the way they haven't been able to before, and and. In all our research, we just came across these friction points of time, cost, and convenience that prevented, you know, female and male consumer in that eighteen to forty-year-old demographic from engaging in professional skincare. Yeah, and so if you wouldn't mind walking us through the the process, like explain what it feels like. Uh, obviously, everyone will go for themselves and try it out after this. But w- explain what it feels like to show up. What's the the service level. How does it? Um, how do you experience Heyday as a consumer? 
from start to finish? Yeah, I think we're trying to be a lot more, I'd say, holistic and 360 about about that experience, Morty. So it, it starts from when you go to the website to book. Um, and we want that to be a lot more of a, a seamless, frictionless experience. Um, you know, our doors are structured where we're, um, you know, we're open longer hours. It's easier for people to um, to book and, and similar to Uber, Uber, you know, once you set up your, your online profile, it's, it's even easier second time round. I think when it gets to the, the in-shop experience, um, you know, and we talk a lot internally about taking the facial out of the spa. And I think for us, that's a really important nuance because when you do hear the word spa, it has this beauty, pampering, indulgent connotation. And for us, I think we've been a lot more design inspired, gender neutral, creating this like unintimidating semi-private space within Heyday where you've got the right amenities with, you know, your phone chargers, much more comfortable chairs with back support. We've got a Spotify playlist. Uh, you know, we've got plants. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a spa. It doesn't feel like a museum. It almost feels like, um, you know, sort of feels like the third home. Mm-hmm. And I think for us creating this sort of less intimidating environment is one where it then facilitates a much more open dialogue between esthetician and clients where there, there are these nuggets of information and, and aha moments where people really learn and understand their skin from an expert so they they leave heyday feeling a lot more empowered and equipped on you know how to use when to use and why to use their products to get the best out of their skin and everyone's got different skin everyone's on a different journey so that expertise is is really important and then the final part of the journey for us is when people leave our shop that's not where the experience ends it's it's where now that we understand your skin type and concern we can target you with thoughtful touch points and tips and tricks on on how to get the best out of your skin in between seeing us again. So we really sort of view that as our as our flywheel and a constant way to engage with uh, with our clients. Yeah. And so given that you um, focus on originally at least and probably changing over time, but a, a young customer, uh, a millennial customer most probably, um, could you uh, disabuse those listeners who believe that um, skin care – and indeed facials is something that women only do when I mean, everyone's got skin so you know it, it's one where 20 percent of our clients are are men um everyone wants to look after them themselves and you know from a male point of view it's you want to again create this unintimidating environment versus you know what can be quite an emasculating experience at a spa but i think i think millennial and the, the Gen Z clients, Morty, they've never been more educated as a, I'd say, as a, as a cohort around the importance of skin. And I think it's also interesting because one thing that's really evolved since Heyday has opened um, is I think skincare has separated itself from a broader beauty definition. Where I say beauty has historically been skin, makeup, and color. And I think skincare is actually a lot more sort of isolated or separated right now because you know, again, people do view it much more as a, as a daily routine and a component of something they should be doing as part of them being the best selves. Yeah. And talk about a little bit, um, SPF and the, um, hopefully the sort of democratization of SPF into daily habits. Do you see that actually happening? Are people uh, buying increasingly since you've been open more SPF products? Are you holding more SPF products or is it is it sort of still a bit of an uphill battle for that to become a daily routine? Um, surprisingly, I thought we'd need to educate clients more on the importance of daily SPF, um, and we haven't needed to do that. So um, I would actually say it's one of our, our, our core three categories that that have the highest product purchase, Morty, are cleansers, moisturizers, and SPF. And if you if you speak to any esthetician, you know their their two their two top tips will inevitably be one wear, wear SPF daily and two drink water, stay hydrated. Drink water. There we go. That's an that's an easy one. That's that's uh, that's if, in everything, right? It's it's just, it's the the advice. Um, so um, there is. Let's talk. Just switching a little bit to just yeah. the business side of this. Obviously, you have a a finance background. Um, you are now in a, a business that 
requires both sides of your brain. Um, you uh, obviously have a very beautiful aesthetic that you've built uh, in your shops and, and storefronts uh, and the branding. And could you talk a little bit about how it's been building a business like this uh, as someone who came out of finance first and uh, and some of the things that you've learned as, a, uh, as it's, what has it been, five, six years now? Five years. And it'll be a sixth, sixth anniversary this summer. There we go. I'll, I'll, I might asterisk that with our store closures last year, but yes. No, we don't talk about those. We don't talk about those. It, it's all going to, they're going to come back in, you know, tenfold. Um, and so, yeah, and then the uh, this follow on to that would be, you know, um, talking a bit about the future as well and, and what the, the, the rollout plans are and, and what, what are the things that are ahead? Sure. I mean, I, I think, I mean, from my experience, banking is, I would think, one of the most valuable stepping stones and learning environments to be, to being a successful entrepreneur because I think you just get like this broad, a broad toolbox that, that covers I think sort of three broad buckets of strategic financial and operational areas that let you cover, you know, a lot of what a startup and, and early stage high growth company needs to navigate. So um, I may not have fully appreciated it at the time when I was in banking, but it has certainly been invaluable, um, you know, invaluable to me. Uh, I, I think, you know, one thing that people find a little bit of a paradox in terms of my journey, but despite starting businesses like literally off the back of a napkin, I'm incredibly risk averse. And I think, you know, when I look to look to start businesses, you, it's always, it's where you take, you know, sort of smaller bets. And we're just in an environment today, Morty, where I would argue it's, it's, it's never, you've never needed less capital to start a business today. So, you know, the downside is there's, there's so many more businesses getting launched, but your ability to like test and learn and iterate and get feedback. And if you're like listening to the clients, um, they're actually going to help inform the product roadmap. And I think where you, where you then want to sort of spend resources and, you know, move some of the pieces around the, the, the chessboard accordingly. And I think some people take a, a little bit of a swing for the fence. Let, let's bet the ranch type approach. But in this environment, like clients have never been more willing to give feedback. So it's, it's, I think one thing, if I look back, it's been a miss on in my career is the number of hours you've spent sitting around the boardroom table arguing about what we think the customer wants, like ask them. So like let's test and learn and iterate. And I think the the access to data and analytics that were, were heavily informed from my banking days have been so, so powerful in terms of, um, you know, applying that to, you know, to the strategic roadmap that we want our brand to be on. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is when you think about any business that has a that relies on a very strong point of view in order to operate its business. I mean, you think of Stanley Marcus when he was at Neiman Marcus uh, back in the day. You know, he he brought the world to Texas, and they all relied on him to bring taste uh, into their lives. Barney's is, I, I think, was something that had that, which people miss, quite frankly. Mister Porter uh, has a very yep. sort of that vibe, very educational, fun, uh, and then sort of leading you into the product quite gracefully, at least originally. I think that's how they how they operated. Um, it feels like you have that kind of relationship with the customer, which is, as I said earlier, one of trust, um, but also education. Um, and so, you know, there's often a balance, I think, for an entrepreneur that is in the position that you're, you're in. So when you're actually selling products other than services, those products are multi-brand. You're saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to say this is the best. This is why it's the best. We're going to carry the best. Um, but there's also a temptation to develop one's own, pro- own products um, over time. Uh, every business thinks about it. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Because the, 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 there's no yeah. right or wrong answer, I think. It's just, it's just depending on, on the brand, right? No, it, it's such a great question, Morty. I think part of it also just works backwards from what type of you know, with your North Star, what type of brand, what type of business do you want to build? And I think if you need to have been an entrepreneur that's raised capital around doing that, I think making sure there's alignment with your investors on what that chart looks like. So, you know, within Heyday, to your point, we curate third-party brands. And again, like we've just done research around our clients have got an overwhelming preference for us to be that filter and heavily vet third-party products in the market. So, we can stand with our hand on heart and say, 
we've got the best brands in the market and we can cover all price types, skin types, concerns, et cetera, to, to do right by your skin. Um, there's a temptation to obviously sort of do your own brand given it's far more profitable, but our, our top KPI is around uh, customer retention and NPS. So you may leave some dollar some dollars on the table or some profit on the table in the short term, but to our mind, we don't want to be doing anything too, too quickly at the expense of building a long-term sustainable business. And that's a, it's so tough as an entrepreneur. I mean, even back to my Saludos days, in our first few years, we said no to all department stores because we said no, no, because we need that cachet of being being the brand that at the time was in the, the Ron Hermans, the Stephen Allens, the opening ceremonies and all the collaborations that you do with that. And when you get big, big, big accounts knocking with big orders, it's, it's very tempting. But they're also, there's no risk for them because if the brand doesn't work, then it's no harm, no foul, and yep. they, they move on. So it's one where I think playing the long game um, will, will generally, in, in my experience, serve you much better. So you've had this business uh, during probably the biggest boom in skincare and hair care in living memory. and. Um, you therefore sit at this kind of interesting sort of pinnacle of that industry because you are the edit, right? Or one of, but uh, arguably yep. the edit of what's best. Um, how have you been able to um, build on those relationships with these brands? And, and I'm sure people throw themselves at you. The brands are all want to be in heyday because it's one of those places to be. Um, how do you, how do you vet who's going to be in heyday? So we've actually got a really unique process brought in. I think this is one where we, we, we leverage our competitive advantage quite, quite authentically here. Um, I mean, pre-pandemic, we had north of 350 estheticians on our team. And obviously with growth, that number continues to increase. Uh, so we've got, a, we've got a, 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 an advisory council made up of those experts and they, they vet and test products really thoroughly. Um, we do do it via a blind testing process, so they're actually not biased by by the brand, by the price point, or anything like that. So we're almost getting, I'd sort of say, like the creme de la creme of, of experts. No pun intended. That, that, exactly. <laughs> um, that, that are helping say, um, you know, yes, this is a great product and it's additive to the assortment, or, or no, it's not. Um, so, um, you know, for us, we've still got our, our eyes and ears to the ground on on being out there because, um, you know, there are some great products out there, but this is also a category, Morty, where I think the downside of, of our categories, because it's so easy to find a contract manufacturer and get a product made, there is a lot of product proliferation and there is a lot of noise out there and there are a lot of products out there that just don't work and do the right thing for, for clients. So I think that's why we're, we're incredibly cautious in our, um, in our vetting approach. And and so the rollout of the business is presumably an omni-channel one. Absolutely. I mean, I think to be a brand that wins the, the hearts and minds of of customers over time is you have to be omni-channel. And customers don't necessarily talk about omni-channel the way that we do from the inside out. Uh, they just want a brand that they can engage with like anywhere, anytime, anyplace. So uh, we are huge proponents of of a high touch personalized physical experience so we're going to be incredibly aggressive um in terms of rolling rolling out our experience and we've got we got got a flag in the ground in new york we've got a flag in the ground in la and we we, we actually open a door in in philadelphia and the, the the demand there just like massively exceeded our expectations so uh we've got really aspirational goals morty to be the skincare and facial brand that rolls out across the u.s yeah um, and you, you know, you need to support that with, with a, a differentiated online experience that makes it so easy for, for our clients to engage both, you know, in between their shop appointments or in areas where we don't have a heyday. Um, where can you take some of that, you know, that expertise and touch points, um, and replicate that online in a way where it's, it's never going to be as good as the, as the in-person experience. Um, but we can still, we can still lean in around, learnings from that in shop expertise and experience to to online personalization and 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 individual skincare journeys yeah and do you think that based on the um intricacy of the knowledge that's needed to provide the the, the service and the trust 
Uh, do you think you're able to bottle the IP, as it were, um, of the store experience to be able to franchise it internationally to Dubai and, and, and the Far East and elsewhere? I mean, do you, do you think that's in your future? You know, I, I think it is. I mean, I, I think, I think again, like democratizing skincare isn't, um, isn't a US centric opportunity. I, so, um, we've got, we've got a younger generation across mid East. You've got a number of beauty centric areas in, you know, China, Korea, Japan, um, you know, everyone wants to, you know, look good and feel great, Morty, and I think have the best possible skin. So, you know, franchising is one where I've done more of a 180 on it over the last few years. But <laughs> other people's know, money. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just you just go straight. You get you get so concerned with what is this going to do to the in-store experience, which has been yep. something that we've worked so so hard to, um, you know, to to, to keep consistent and. Again, I just think it's one where where you've got a franchise partner, you've just got this inherent alignment of interests that you don't necessarily have under a company operated basis, and their focus on product quality and the customer experience is is aligned with yours. So, I think you know franchising is the best way for us to you know to expand and certainly become a household name. But you know we can do it with the right quality. Um, and in shop execution that we we have with our company operated doors. So you stated in a previous interview that skincare is a category where everyone feels like the brands are talking to them instead of doing something for them. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think there is just so much product proliferation in the market right now, Morty, with you know what what products are doing, and there is this there is this more is better approach and. To my mind, I don't understand how companies can push that when they don't they don't understand the skin type and skin concern of of the client that they're speaking to. Um, so it's really hard to personalize because you could have a great product that works well for you on your skin. It doesn't work well for me. But th- this is one where it's just it's all around the sale, and it, to my mind, it's it, again it's very very transactional, um, and they're not working backwards from. I think like the routine perspective and what products are going to work for what clients to bring out the best of their skin. Yeah. And so it's, it's just, a- it's, it's, it's transactional. They're, they're, they're totally, totally missing. And I think the whole structure of the, of the category is one that actually hasn't really evolved over the last decade. And that's the, that's the opportunity. Yeah, here. If I could, if I could say it a little bit differently, which I think is really interesting is the whole industry. I mean, and not beauty industry, the whole, retail consumer industry talks today about some, another buzzword customer centricity right and 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 the laying on of hands right of, of of onto the consumer so literally you are starting with the laying on of hands and you're right there up in their up in their face uh and then you're backing away from that so you're starting right at the customer and then you're you're the concentric circles away from that is what you're doing and i think that's probably you know, one of the the nuclei of your of your strategies that I think is is such a great thing. And speaking of laying on of hands, so you know, you're probably one of the best people to speak to about um, at this point in time as we unravel from this horrific pandemic um, about you know, the, the the role of touch, the role of retail uh, in the future. Everyone likes to say that it's only going to be e commerce. I mean, I can't, I don't believe that for a second. I think that people are going to be racing around, going to more basketball games and theaters and movies and parties and dinners than ever before. Um, what's your take uh, on touch and physical retail uh, over the next period? Yeah, I think it's it's certainly going to be very interesting in terms of customer spending patterns and what is what, what is more of a transient shift versus versus permanent changes. But I think Morty, anything that ties to a physical experience around um, helping people make an investment in themselves and be a better version of themselves um, is going to continue to be at a, at a premium. So when I look at anything, you know, outside of skincare, if it's around, you know, if it's around like massage, if it's around sort of like stretch body alignment, um, you know, other, other wellness or sort of self-care, um, concepts i see i see high pent up demand and i see i see a real need for those those brands and services um you know i think around you know 
what I'd sort of term other sort of more traditional retail concepts, I think there's going to be pressure on them to to be a little more sort of like differentiated in how they execute, you know, because again, you're just sort of, you're after, you're all competing in a very similar fashion for for the same share of wallet with, with customers. But I think that's ultimately a good thing. I think it just, it forces you to raise the bar of um, how you talk, how you engage and, you know, where you can create some sort of like different service or experience in shop. But doing that, um, again, like there's just, there's no substitute for, for that physical engagement, um, you know, compared to an online experience. So online will still be there, but it's a complement and again, like additive to, uh, to that physical experience. There's no substitute for a physical experience. I think we're going to leave it at there. Uh, Adam Ross, the CEO of Heyday, thank you so much for joining me on the safari. Thank you for having me. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.